Good morning. Today is the 17th of February, year 2005. My name is John Miller and I'm a volunteer here at the Palm Springs Air Museum. And the mission of our department here in the library is to record and preserve history of our nation's conflicts. And today we're focusing on World War II. And my special guest is um, Colonel Ken Vallis. And Ken, We'll proceed with this interview and typical military procedure here. I'm going to have you give your name and spell it and your birth date, and then we'll go from there. My name, rank, and serial number. Huh? Your name, rank, and serial number. Okay. My name is Ken Vallis. I retired the United States Air Force, and I was born in 1921, September 19th in New York City. I understand that uh, World War II veterans are dying off at the rate of 1,500 a, a day, and so I'm glad that uh, Palm Springs Air Museum is doing this recording of some of the history of World War II directly from the people who participated. Can, um you said you're born in New York City. Tell us uh, a little bit about the history of your family before that. Uh, your grandparents obviously came from another country, and maybe your parents did too. But uh, tell us about that part of your background. Well, my mother's uh, my mother was born upstate New York, and her people came from uh, Ireland through Canada. It, they left Ireland during the potato famine and they went to Quebec City. And her mother was born in Quebec City, but my mother was born in upstate New York. My great-grandfather, even though he was in Ireland and Canada, enlisted in the New York Regiment during the Civil War. And uh, he came out, I think, with one leg. And my father's people, were from, uh, he was born in New York City also, but his uh, parents were from what was known as Bohemia, which is now part of Czechoslovakia, the Czech, Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. And he was in the Navy from 1904 to 1906. In fact, he was in the Navy, what was called the White Fleet, when Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, sent it to Japan he was having an argument with Mark Hanna in the house about getting money for the Navy. So he sent them way out to the Pacific, and then Mark Hanna had to appropriate money for bringing it back. And when they were coming back, the president ordered them to go to San Francisco in 1906 because there was an earthquake there. So they arrived three to five days after the earthquake and participated in the cleanup. So you've got a... Um military history in your family background. A little bit. What did your father do as an occupation? He was a, uh, a postal service employee. He was a post office uh, registry clerk and then a postal inspector for the United States Post Office. He was also an entrepreneur. He had tried, he had tried a, a grocery store on First Avenue in New York and he also tried a fishing boat down at the battery, renting, renting it out and taking people fishing. He had good instincts and he was trying, but he really relied on his postal employee's job. We had six kids. My mother and father had six kids. And we were all born in the same house on First Avenue in New York between 69th and 70th. We moved to New Jersey in 1932 and in 1942, my older brother went into the Army, I went into the Army Air Corps, and my youngest brother went into the Navy. So really? my mother had three sons in the military during World War II. Overlooked one question, Ken, and that is uh, when your grandparents came over from the old country, uh, what did they do for a living? <laughs> That's a good question. My mother's people were farmers up in upstate New York. They operated on what was then a big farm, 160 acres. <laughs> yeah. But they didn't own it. 
and uh, and then my father's people. I think this is where my father got his entrepreneurial instincts. His father invented a cockroach powder, and actually it was carbolic acid it mixed with uh, wax. Very, they used to use carbolic acid for sterilizing hospital rooms years ago, but this carbolic acid would kill anything. And uh, he had a can, we had a can for many years, said Uncle John's, his name was John Vallis, Uncle John's cockroach paste. Really? To kill cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's it. That's very interesting. Okay, um, you and your two brothers went in service and you all probably enlisted. What do you recall about December 7th, 1941? Well, December 7th was a Sunday and I was uh, with some people in, uh, in New York and a girl that I had been raised with, who lived also in New York City, named Veronica Turner, had just been married. And I was visiting her parents and her brother, and they decided to go to Long Island to visit Veronica and her new husband, and I went with them. And we were sitting there in their living room, having tea. They were Irish, and uh, we had tea two or three times a day. And um, somebody turned the radio on, and we heard the announcer say that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. And I, of course, will never forget that. Prior to that, Ken, uh, and I overlooked this, uh, I'm sorry I did, but tell us about your, your early schooling, uh, and then on through high school, and then beyond high school, if you want to start with the elementary education, what you're interested in, any other anecdotes that you might well, provide I, uh, us? I went the first six years in New York City. PS 82 in the corner of 70th and 1st Avenue. And uh, when we moved to New Jersey, I went to 7th uh, grade at Pleasant View, which was a one-room schoolhouse on, uh, on the highway between Somerville and Princeton. And uh, it was a great educational experience. Mrs. Funkhauser was a teacher, and she had two classes, 6th and 7th in that school. And she used to get very frustrated. And I think back about how wicked we were and about snowball fights and throwing erasers around and things like that. And then I went to, I graduated from Bloomingdale School in Hillgrove Township and then went to Somerville High School. I had, uh, I thought, a good education at Somerville High School. And then I went to Rutgers and I did. did you? Rutgers for three years, and on December 7th, I was still enrolled at Rutgers, and uh, was looking forward to graduate. I was in the class of 42, and uh, I went down on the 8th, and I think everybody left school that day. You see, it was all male, private school at that time, all male, and everybody went down to enlist, and I went down to Newark. And I tried to enlist in the Navy because my uncle, my father, had been in the Navy, and I thought that would be the thing to do. <clears throat> but I had an appendectomy in April, and they told me you had to wait a year between an appendectomy and enlistment. So I went back, went to school, and I was going to wait till April to go in there. But instead of that, I went to Somerville to the Army recruiting station, and I enlisted in the uh, Army Air Forces, and that uh, was uh, in June when they called me up. There was a waiting period, and uh, I remember that they moved graduation up in 1942 so that we could leave to go into the Army because 50 to 60 percent of the class was going into the military. Well, you grew up during the Depression, oh went to gosh. school during the Depression. <clears throat> what do you recall about that and the difficulty your, your family had in keeping things together during those difficult years? It was very difficult. And I think today <clears throat> that uh, we still have many of the uh, lessons that we learned during that time instilled in us, like turning off the lights, not wasting water taking care of your clothes and conserving things. I think that's uh, 
things we learned. And uh, my wife, we've been married 60 years now, uh, came from eastern Colorado, and she grew up during the Depression, and she's more conservative than I am in, in that respect. She watches everything very carefully, and it's because her father was a dentist, and uh, he used to charge two dollars for a cleaning, and uh, people would pay him by giving him a chicken or a turkey or a, a slice of bacon or something. They, they were great lessons. We had a very difficult time because they put my father on four days a week. The grocery store he had planned went bankrupt, went out of business. And uh, we had to really conserve. I worked when I was in high school delivering newspapers. I made 35 cents every day. I delivered my bicycle, on my bicycle. And, uh, and I also worked on a, on a farm. We shopped corn, we cut hay, and uh, I made a dollar a day when I worked full days in the summer. And I saved money during all that time, too. And yet, I gave money home to my mother and father from the time I was 12 years old until my father died and my mother died. I sent money home. Really? You know, the strange thing about it, everybody was so poor in those days, we didn't even realize we were that poor. Because everybody, well, everybody was, was the same way. Everyone right? in the same boat. Yeah. But everybody was helpful. Yeah. You know, we used to have friends that, uh, a Norwegian woman that used to bring butter. She had two cows, but she made butter and she used to bring butter down. She even brought bread. She made bread down with that homemade bread when it was still warm with that homemade butter. It was one of the greatest things that ever invented by God. And then there was another family that uh, had dairy cows and uh, we used to buy, I don't know, I think it was a 10 quart pail of milk every other day. And I think we paid like 15 or 25 cents for the whole 10 quarts. And eggs, we used to buy eggs, you know, for a nickel or a dime a dozen. Yeah. Bread was 10 cents. On specials, it was 5 cents a loaf. They were not happy days, but you didn't really uh, know that we were in pain. Exactly. We grew a lot of food. We did a lot of things. We used to sing a song. My father has five sons, and he used to sing a song, Potatoes are Cheaper, Tomatoes are Cheaper, Now's the Time to Fall in Love. Now's the time to form a baseball team. He said if he got four more sons, he'd have a baseball team. <laughs> what kind of, uh, well, again, in your schooling days, what subjects interested you the most? And uh, how about athletic uh, pursuits? Did you have time for that? No, I didn't have time. I always had a job. I worked. And uh, I, I majored in uh, accounting. And then after World War II, I went back to Rutgers and then went to DU, and I did some graduate work in economics. But uh, I was int always interested in, uh, in business subjects. I went to, uh, when I came back from World War II, I went to see a woman who was the, the head psychiatrist at Rutgers. I don't know whether that was her title, but uh, Dr. Williams gave me some tests, a battery of tests, and uh, I remember she called me by my first name and she said, Kenneth, what you've got to major in is business. You've got definitely an inclination to be in business, either insurance, finance, accounting, or perhaps someday you can own your own business. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Did you have any interest in aviation at that point? Actually, when I lived in New Jersey, I had a friend named Henry Van Nuys, whose family had a dairy farm. Henry and I would drive down to Newark, to Newark Airport, which was a big airport then because LaGuardia and Kennedy were not built. and. Uh, all the New York traffic used to come into Newark. We'd park outside the airport 
and watch planes land and take off. And in those days, you know, they're mainly DC-3s, what we call C-47s, yeah. DC-3s, military called C-47s. And then uh, there was another place where there was private aircraft, and we uh, used to go up there and watch those in our first airplane ride. For Henry and me, I think it cost us two dollars a piece. And we got in an airplane in uh, Teterboro, New Jersey, and we went up for about a five or ten minute flight, and of course it was a great, great, exciting thing to go up in the air. Do you remember what airplane that was? You know, I've always, I've often thought about that. Actually, Henry and I were young kids, and we were both scrunched in the back. It was a two-seater, open cockpit airplane. For some reason, I think it was a Piper, some type of Piper. It was not a Cub, but it was, a, I think, a Piper airplane. Was but it an open, open cockpit? Open cockpit, yeah. I know it had fixed air, fixed landing gear. Oh, yeah. Open cockpit. Uh, it had a standard propeller, no no uh, feathering, you know, no. moving the propeller, propeller around. Uh, and I think, oh, I know it was noisy, but the guy was signaling with his hands. That's all he ever did. We had no headphones. And we just went up, made a trip around. But in 1941, before December, I went with some guys down to uh, Miami Beach, Florida. And uh, for $25, we flew from Miami to Havana. Really? Yeah, $25. And I thought that was a lot of money, and it was. But uh, that was the trip that really got me interested in aviation because I was amazed. My mother kept a postcard I wrote to her uh, for many years. It uh, said, Mom, I'm up in an airplane now. We're 5,000 feet. And there were 16 of us in the airplane, 16 people in one airplane. I said, can you imagine this? I thought it was a great thing. That was an experience. Yeah, was. was that a version of the DC-3? It was, yeah. yeah. Well, okay, so you had some interest in aviation, and you signed up right away, and, and you were delayed a little bit because of a uh, health problem. Yeah. So you were called up in June of 42? 42, yeah. And uh, tell us about your basic training and <laughs> primary and so forth. Well, the first thing we did was go to San Antonio Aviation Cadet Center, which was the uh, adjacent to Kelly Field in San Antonio. and. Uh, we got basic training. Uh, we learned to march, learned to dress. We had a lot of ath athletic activities. I think we had two physical training periods, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And uh, in that time, we took a train from New Jersey up to Buffalo and then west to Cleveland and down to Little Rock, Arkansas, and went to uh, Texas. The windows didn't open in that train. They told us not to bring anything but uh, shaving tools and a brush. So I had no clothes. You had no suitcase. And I had a white shirt and a tie and a brown overcoat. And we got to Texas, and it was getting cold at nights particularly, and they didn't have any uniforms, they didn't have anything. It took six weeks, and we were in the same clothes, so every night I'd wash out my underwear, and uh, I think I washed my shirt once. And then finally they did get some coveralls, they were not the fatigues that they use today because these were just plain olive drab, and we had those for another two or three weeks, but everything was delayed. and. Uh, Everything took time. We had uh, had to wait, after we got the fatigues, we had to wait longer for the shoes and the other items of delivery. So from there we went to... Uh, Excuse me, uh, do you remember your drill instructor there at basic training? Oh yeah. <laughs> no one will forget that, will they? No, he won't. He was a sergeant. And he was one of the nastiest people I've ever met, yeah. He they're, trained, <laughs> they're, tra they're trained to be that way. Yeah, I know it. No, he was terrible. Uh, <laughs> he'd say, 
why are you moving your eyes? What are you looking for? Do you want to buy this place? And of course you had to say no sir, yes sir, to him even though he was a sergeant. And uh, he'd say, hold your stomach in. Have you got any muscles there? Have you got any muscles any place? Have you got any muscles in your head? And then when we would march, he would say, I want you guys to sing. Let's sing, I've been working on the railroad. You know that, don't you? Everybody, I've. <laughs> so we'd sing, I've been working on the railroad all day long. And uh, one day we went on a hike. I think it was a 25-mile hike. And the shoes were new. And we all came back with great big blisters, blood in our socks and in our shoes. We cleaned the shoes out. And I remember he came up into the barracks. These were big barracks tar paper buildings, but 80 men downstairs, one bathroom, 80 men, 80 bunks, and a bathroom on the second floor. And he came in, we were all supposed to stand in front of our bunks and our foot lockers and stand at attention while he went by. And he said, you got sore feet, you're just a bunch of sissies. Nobody was allowed to go on sick call or go any place to get any, so we went in the shower and just washed them off. <laughs> Nobody had band-aids, band-aids. Did you ever have to scrub the boardwalk with a toothbrush? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah, these drill instructors were, were selected that way. I think it was part of the discipline they taught us. It's discipline, right, yeah. to teach. But we also had the, the quarter or the 50 cent piece test on the bed, you know. You had to bounce. You had the bed be made so yeah. tightly that a 50 cent piece would bounce. And you had to have those square corners there, otherwise you get chewed square out for corners. that. Yeah. Well, well, we that, learned how to make beds. Yes, we did. <laughs> okay, you got through basic all right, and... Uh, then we went to pre-flight. Now, a lot of the kids were selected out at that point, weren't they? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They started the screening process. We had uh, so many tests, psychological tests in which the most embarrassing questions were asked for kids like us, you know, uh, 19, 20 years old. And uh, most of us, I did, I came from a farming community and we, uh, we locked the door in the bathroom when we went to, when we were home. And uh, we never heard anybody talk like this guy did. And so we had, we learned a lot, let me say this, we learned a lot. And then they also had films about venereal disease that they showed, I think, every week or every month. And one of them was so bad that I had to put my head down between my legs because it made me sick. I thought I was going to faint. And, uh, well, they had personal hygiene physical hygiene, films all the time. The training was extensive and uh, intensive at the same time. The psychomotor tests were tough too, the coordination oh, tests. Coordination tests. Eyesight, things like that. Color blindness, yeah. And, uh, but we kept getting them over and over again. And the, the questions some of these doctors asked, I said, were, were embarrassing for young kids. But nevertheless, it was a good experience, and they they were weeding out people. Yeah. At that time, they were dropping out. I think over thirty percent were dropped out. Yeah, at least. The, or, well, they were being considered for flight training, and so they wanted to screen them before they gave them waste any time in flight schools with them. So they would send them to another barrage of tests, and then they'd send them to the infantry. Now we were in the army then, you know. And of course that was uh, not desirable. We all thought we were going to be aviators, wear wings, and uh, look like the guys in the movies that made Howard Hughes movies, I Wanted Wings. Were you selected as for pilot training at that point? You know they when made, they used to rank it from 10 down to 7 and so made, forth? They made those determinations at that point, yeah. yeah. And they also decided who was going to go to bombardier school and who was going to navigation school mm -hmm. and gunnery school. <laughs> yeah, uh, I we know. Had, we had gunnery school candidates too. 
but the candidates for uh, navigator and bombardier were officer positions, but the gunnery schools no. was enlisted. Yeah. Okay, after basic then, uh, you went to primary where, right at Kelly Field? No, went to U Valley. We had a, uh, a, uh, a private school, Hangar 6 it was called, in U Valley. And it was a lush place, honestly. I gotta go again, I'm sorry. It, was this in Texas? Texas, Uvalde, Texas. You haven't heard of Uvalde? No, you just take My your God, time. I'm sorry. No, God, I understand this. Damn pills. I understand this. No problem. No, I say they cut, they cut down on the program. Yeah, I the um, I was training in a, as a flight engineer in a B twenty nine when the war was over. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, Pretty old. When you talked to Bob Butler, were you aware he's going to be 90? Yeah. In April? Isn't it incredible? It's, it's just absolutely incredible. Yeah. He played tennis until last year, and he still plays golf. Bob Butler. Yeah. It's right down the middle every time. Okay, Colonel, we'll. we'll take up uh, this interview again at the point where you were leaving basic and going to primary but you uh, mentioned to me during the break something about General Hap Arnold visited your base. Oh yeah just before we left it was a big event because Arnold was then a four-star general and the most we had seen were full colonels. Full colonel command at the base and uh, we spent a whole day cleaning up making sure everything was clean, no cigarette butts any place. Uh, it's called policing, police duty, in that parlance. And we picked up everything we could on the ground. And then we marched on the field in very, very strict formations, very carefully. But the guys that I was with, my class, we had uh, fatigues. And so they put us way in back so that Arnold didn't have to look at us and the pictures wouldn't show. They were conscious of those things even then. So they had all the tall, well-built guys in front and you went down to the back to the shorter guys. <laughs> nothing changes. <laughs> and to the, nothing changes. Uh, plus et chance, plus et la même chose, the French say. But we uh, went to uh, the uh, field and uh, uh, a life photographer took a picture and it was published in Life magazine that year, and I still have a copy of that. A great picture. And I sent one to my mother and I said, this is me back here, but of course you can't distinguish anything in the back of the photo. But it was a great experience because this was my first sighting of a four-star general. <laughs> okay, uh, leaving San Antonio? We were in the uh, Aviation Cadet Center, San Antonio. From there we went to Uvalde, Texas, which I think is only about uh, 90 I think it's 90 kilometers, about 60 miles from San Antonio. Uvalde is a small town in a rural area, agricultural area. Uh, the vice president 
Roosevelt's first vice president, John Nance Garner, was from U of Albi. I remember him. Yeah. And uh, we, had, we went to a base called Hangar 6, which was a private school. Now, the Army had taken over a lot of private schools, including Parks, the big one in, in St. Louis, and several others, one in Illinois, and this Hangar 6 down in Texas. So many of our instructors were civilians. Yeah. We had a tactical officer in charge, and we had two Army Air Corps pilots who gave check rides, and they were kind of hard-ass kinds of guys, too. Uh, Nobody really wanted to go for a check ride with, I know one guy, Lieutenant McCoy, and nobody really wanted to go with him. But uh, we had PT-19s, <coughs> which was a Fairchild monoplane, fixed landing gear, open cockpits, and it was a wonderful airplane, I think. Now, uh, we never had an accident, and we had a guy down there who was a civilian instructor who one day put on an exhibition with his hands up in the air, and he flew the airplane, take off to landing with his knees. Really? Great. Yeah. So we knew it was a good airplane. And it looked good, too. It was made uh, by Fairchild in Hagerstown, Maryland. Uh, it only had, I think it was a 175 horsepower light combing engine. But we took off at 60 to 80 miles an hour, left the ground, and we could fly at 120 miles per hour, indicated airspeed. And uh, when I look back, I think we didn't do any night flying right there. And uh, we did learn acrobatics. We learned to do a loop. Uh, barrel rolls and all, Immelman, all the rest of them. And, uh, we did figure eights over fence lines in the, in the pasture. Very good flying habits. But you know, I think we only got, uh, I think we only got 60 hours flying time in two months, which was not much. They had good ground schools. They had a very good ground school there. And so we learned a lot. We had ground school, navigation, electrical systems. Were you limited on flying because of lack of aircraft or instructors or? I don't think so. I just didn't have anything big planned. We weren't. We didn't go in cross countries at, at primary school. They saved that to basic. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that many of us would have gotten lost if uh, we'd gone on cross countries. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some glider pilots who, uh, whose wives today, claim that they weren't towed into France, they would have wound up in Iceland. But. Uh, <laughs> because of their sense of direction. But uh, we, didn't have, we didn't have any radio equipment. In fact, at the PT-19, we were supposed to hit the stick, bang the knees of the instructor. He was in the front seat, we were in the back seat, students in the back seat. If, he wanted, if you wanted him to take it over, he wanted you to take it over, he would move it, bang your knees, so you would take it over. That was a signal for taking it over. There was no verbal communication, open cockpit. You wear those helmets. But uh, one of the instructors developed a system. He put together a piece of tubing. It was rubber tubing. We didn't have plastic like we do on oxygen machines today. And he put uh, it, it between the cockpits. And on one end, the instructor had a funnel going into it. And on the other end, we had a smaller funnel we put on our ear. Really? And that became a good way to communicate, yeah. Could you hear? Yeah, could do it very well, yeah. Amazing. Crude. Uh, and I was thinking how, you know, this plane looks almost primitive today, open cockpit airplanes with fixed landing gear. Even these little ones on the private landing fields are better equipped than that. But it was a good airplane. I haven't seen any. I don't know whether you have any here at Palm Springs. I think you did have one. There was one down there here was in, one the, one time, in, the, in the hangar. I'm not sure yeah. if it's still there or not, but there was a PT-19 yeah. there. I liked that airplane. It was very nice. So I'm from Uval and I liked the city of Uvalde. Uh, it was quaint, but had wide streets like modern towns do. And uh, it had 
a Rexall drugstore downtown. That if we got off on Saturday, everybody would go down there for a milkshake. And I think they were 10 cents, but it was worth it. That's <laughs> a lot of money, but it was worth it. <laughs> and we, from there, we went to uh, what we call basic flying training, and we went to Goodfellow at San Angelo. I think that was about almost in the center of Texas, about 100 miles away from San Antonio. Again, it's in an agricultural center in middle Texas. But at Goodfellow, there were a lot of, we're not far from Midland, there were lots of oil fields around. And in those days, they used to fire off the gas. They didn't try Burned to capture it, off. it burned yeah. it off, yeah. So this was the first place we had night flying. And I can tell you that my first night, it was probably the most fearsome night in Navy, even considering combat. I was really scared about taking off at night, flying around, and then coming back at night. There were uh, so many fields burning. If you got too far away, you know, you, you couldn't tell where the airfield was. So that, you had to be very careful. We had a few more instruments in the BT-13. We had a closed cockpit, but we still had fixed landing gear. And it flew a little faster. It was a bigger engine. God, I thought it was a an awesome airplane when I first got into it. And uh, they check you out just two or three rides. <clears throat> it was a very, very intensive training. And uh, one day I went on a trip, and I was using the old eyesight following railroad tracks to the next town. And in Texas, they put names of towns on the roof, usually at the railroad station. <laughs> so it was difficult to get lost if you knew what was happening. Uh, and I went in the wrong direction at one point. And I was about an hour late in getting back with low on fuel. But <clears throat> the squadron commander met me on the flight line. And he said, Vallis, what did you do? Where did you go? And so I explained to him that I had made a wrong turn someplace. But as soon as I found out I was on the wrong, we had a map strapped to our legs. But I came back, and that next morning at roll call at the line, he said, I want all you cadets to know this guy, stand up, Vallis. He said, this guy made a mistake yesterday. He admitted his mistake. He turned around and corrected it. Remember, when you make a mistake, be sure to correct it. <laughs> Were there any instruments? So I got a commendation for it, really. Were there any instruments there, or VORs, or anything like that, to get back to the field? No, we had nothing. Nothing like that. Like no, that. no radio compass or something nothing. like that. No, we didn't have those things. No, you did it all visual. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, we didn't have any instrument flying training, basic training either. We had night, night flying. That was where it began. And we took some cross countries, and that was when I got lost on this one, cross country. And uh, we found, we flew what was called a round robin. We'd fly to one city and down to another and make a big triangle and come back to the, to the base. Uh, it was well structured, I think. Uh, good training. Had good, a good fellow was a military base. We didn't have civilian instructors, we had all military instructors. And military squadron commanders and the whole thing. So we were back in the military after that nice sojourn at uh, Hangar 6 in Uvalde. So then uh, from there to... Uh, from there I went to Lubbock. Oh, Lubbock. Lubbock, Up on Texas. the Panhandle. And the Panhandle, yeah. Not far from Amarillo, from the oh. border. Lubbock was a very nice base. It was, it was a little bit larger than Goodfellow. And we had two types of aircraft. We had AT-17s. Twin engine, AT-17, and I think an 18, AT for advanced trainer, a 17 and a 16, I think, I'm not sure which it was. One was a Curtis, and, and uh, that was a 16, AT-16, and the AT-17. This is the first place where we flew uh, formation, and they put curtains up and we flew instrument. So this is where we learned to fly instrument. So we had a radio there with A and N, mm -hmm. and we used to 
practice that day after day. That was also good training. And then uh, on October 1st, 1943, we had graduation. And then I received my wings and my commission. And at was, Lubbock? October 1st. At Lubbock? At Lubbock, yeah. Yeah. At Lubbock uh, Army Airfield, it was called. Lubbock was a place that uh, we were in our last year as an aviation cadet. And uh, we were buying uniforms. We had, a, I think, a uniform allowance. I don't remember what it was. I think it was $200. And uh, the BX was selling the uniforms. We had to buy them there. We bought a, you know, a build cap, green jacket, blouse, we called them, and pink pants, pink trousers. And uh, I had just been in the BX for fitting or something one day and had just left and I was going over to get a milkshake over at the uh, place where they sold lunches and milkshakes and an airplane flew into the into the BX and killed a couple of cadets and a couple of And employees. you had just left there? Flew right into the building. Huh? You had just left there? I just left the building, yeah. Wow. So I knew that God was saving me for something. And I think today, he's still saving me for something because I've been saved so many times. <laughs> Maybe something special is going to happen. But it better happen soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, from Lubbock, then where? Lubbock, we went to uh, Liberal, Kansas, which was right on the eastern border of Kansas, next to Missouri. Uh, it's right in the... Uh, in what was the Dust Bowl in the 30s. And the day we arrived, <clears throat> the day we arrived, the wind had been blowing and uh, the barracks was filled with sand. It comes through, it was just, they were just tar paper shacks with those flimsy windows. Yeah. There was dust all everything. So we had to clean the barrack, the rooms we had, to clean the beds and take the sand out. And we were there October and November. And on Thanksgiving Day in 1943, it was a very bad day. It was snowing. And the base commander, because he was under some pressure for a deadline for training and shipping us out to what they called OTU, Operational Training Units, insisted we fly that day, Thanksgiving Day. Now, normally the military observes holidays and, and doesn't do this, but uh, this Colonel Bumpus took, issued the order we were going to fly. And then it was a bad day. We shouldn't have been flying that day. Nobody had more than 240 hours. And here we are in B-24s, a four-engine aircraft with 200 and, you know, R-2800, uh, 2800 horsepower engines, four of them. Four of them. And it was a big, big airplane. Powerful. Can you imagine it being a PT-19, a BT-13, uh, an AT-17, then going to a B-24? That's quite a day. transition. Oh, yeah. And then what we have, maybe three flights with an instructor, and they'd, they'd solo us. So anyway, on this day, we were flying radio. We shouldn't have been flying radio in bad weather either because there was no FAA control, you know, in those days. We didn't have anybody watching to see where the airplanes were. If we were assigned altitudes for flying, they tried to separate us by 500-foot intervals when we were in operations. The operations clerks did that. Well, anyway, we lost six airplanes and six crews that day. Oh my six God. airplanes in a one training day at one base. And that was... Uh, Boy, that's pretty costly. That was terrible. I, I flew and landed after one accident, and then there were, which was two airplanes, then there were two or three other accidents. They were mid-air collisions, all, there were three of them, all three accidents that day. And it was 
it was kind of upsetting. You know, these guys we'd been through flying training with, and we knew them, and they were no more. They just cleaned up the debris and sent the bodies wherever they send them. But we realized that uh, flying was dangerous. We also gained a better respect for the weather right there. Yeah, that's terrible. Well, the Bomber Command in England needed needed crewmen at that time, and they were rushing you through there, apparently. That's right. But let me tell you, when I was in 8th Bomber Command in, in Europe, 8th Air Force, uh, they were still losing about one-third of the crews that came over were lost in combat. But they never sent us up in the air when the weather was really bad. When the fog was great, uh, when the weather was rainy or sleety. Uh, but this outfit at, at, at uh, Liberal shouldn't have sent us in the air that day. Did that he was, get any kind of a citation for that? I don't think so. That's, that's I never awful. Read that, no. He should have been removed, yeah. Yeah. It was a terrible thing. Uh, but I said we gained some some respect for the weather and we gained some respect for caution. And then we realized that uh, when you're on the old radio, A and N, you got to be sure there's nobody else on the same level as you, same altitude. Yeah. you got to keep checking that. Okay, from Lubbock then, oh, where? That was interesting. We went to Pueblo Air Force Base, <coughs> Army Air Base in Pueblo, Colorado. Uh, and we were supposed to join an OTU, which was going to go together, all together over to Europe as a unit. As it happened, the unit that I did join later in Europe was the 446, was at Lowry. And I wish I had joined them then, but I didn't. Anyway, I went to, to uh, Pueblo, but they had some problem with airplanes. We only had a few, and they, they weren't maintained well. So they sent us to Westover, uh, not Westover, to uh, Salt Lake City. And at Salt Lake City, we got our crew. I had a, a navigator from Pennsylvania who was still alive, a, uh, a bombardier from Texas, a radio operator from Florida, a flight engineer from Iowa, and uh, a ball turret gunner from Massachusetts, a uh, rear tail gunner from uh, Tennessee, and two waist gunners, one from New York and one from New Jersey. It was really a, I call them a motley crew, but they were really a good representative group of uh, Americans from uh, all over the United States. While we're talking about that, Colonel, let's focus here on the B-24 and uh, uh, tell us some of the features about it. If you want to point to them. Okay. Firstly, this is called the Davis Wing, and when these were assembled, the Davis Wing would go through, through the assembly line. And Henry Ford set up a big assembly line up in, uh, in uh, Minneapolis, I think. Is that Wall Chamberlain? Is that where Wall Chamberlain is? Wall Chamberlain is Minneapolis. Yeah. He set this factory up there because Roosevelt called him and asked him if he could set up an assembly plant for aircraft, and he said, sure, when do you want it, where do you want it? So they started with the Davis wing going through, whereas every other aircraft went through by the fuselage first. Now, the cockpit, the pilot was on this side and the co-pilot on the right, left and right. This turret had two fifty caliber guns, and the bombardier and or the navigator would operate that. Behind the pilot and co-pilot's flight deck, there was a turret here, which the flight engineer had custody of, and down below, behind the pilots, there was a radio desk and a radio operator. Down in the belly, there was this ball turret, which was a ghastly thing, a terrible thing, because you, we only had guys that were five feet or five foot one inch to get in there because they couldn't get in if they were bigger, and they were in a fetal position in there. It was terrible. Could they? Uh... Over a target. 
There's only one way out of that, and that's up into the fuselage, Bring it right? Back up, yeah. And you have to have somebody up there ready and able to do it. And then the rear gunner was also a very small, much smaller than this. Uh, and then two 50 caliber guns on each side, which are called the waist, waist gunners. So we had uh, one, two, three, four, five, six positions with uh, 50 caliber guns. And that's why uh, General LeMay was in the 8th Air Force, and he felt that by consolidating this firepower into certain formations, so he devised what we call the aircraft formation now, which was to have two wings on a lead plane, and that was a flight, and then to have one flight up, one flight in the middle, one flight back, and one flight in the left. So he had 12 aircraft, which is what a squadron put up. And when you concentrated there 12 times 6, remember there are 12 50 caliber guns here because these are dual guns. Mm -hmm. You got 6 times 12, 72, and then because these are double guns, you got 144 50 caliber guns in that little formation of 12 aircraft from one squadron. So it was intensified uh, uh, firepower. And the German fighter pilots restricted it. I re read something recently by a uh, fighter pilot who was giving testimony someplace in the, in the United States. And he said that uh, when the formations were well flown, when they were tight, he said it was very difficult to shoot one down. He said because their firepower was so massive. You know, a 50 caliber. Yeah, I. You saw them. They're yeah. almost five inches. It's a big. A bigger one. Almost half an inch round. Yeah, it's a big piece of ammunition. But anyway, we used to fly at 160 miles an hour indicated airspeed. That's all. Knots or air? No. Really? That's miles. slow. Yeah. We didn't use knots in the airplane. Uh, the Navy did. <laughs> the Navy used knots. But we used indicated airspeed in miles. 160. But and they had more range than the B-17, didn't they? Slightly. And the B-17s, I believe, flew at 155 indicated airspeed. We both carried uh, from four to 6,000 pounds uh, on a daily basis. And if we ever had a, uh, a special mission where we needed more bombs, we could put 8,000 once I flew an airplane with 10,000 pounds in it. You got to realize that uh, this airplane also had tanks in the wings that held, I think, 4,000 gallons. And gasoline is, uh, what, uh, six and a six half pounds, pounds per gallon? So you had 24,000 pounds of fuel on an airplane. You had 10 guys with heavy equipment on it, and you had, we had boxes of 50 caliber ammo, and uh, it was weighted down quite a bit, so you needed these R2800. I came back from one mission, and we were on one engine, we'd lost three engines, and I was over the channel, and we couldn't maintain altitude, we were losing about 300 feet per minute. So I gave an order to throw out everything that we could. We took the guns, the machine guns, and threw them into the channel. All the ammo went into the channel. Everything we can get our hands on. And one of the waste gunners, a wise guy from New York, an Italian kid, he said, do you want us to throw our shoes and our jackets over too? And I said, no, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Well, how much runway did you have to have to take off when you were fully loaded? Well, in uh, in England, we built the airfields, I think there were 125 total that the Americans occupied. There were 5,000 foot runways. You could get off for that kind of weight, huh? Well, you had to go all the way. You had to go all the way. No, we only had 5,000 feet. Uh, and also, only one runway, 150 feet wide. Now, these wings were, what, 86 feet, and we line up one airplane on the left side of the runway of the center line, one on the right side, and we take off at 30-second intervals. Wow. 
Now these commercial airplanes have to wait a minute or two minutes, I think, before they can take off following each other. And they've got wider runways, they've got more powerful aircraft. That's so we wouldn't get into prop wash, that we alternated mm -hmm. left and right. But 30 seconds was not much time. Now this is the airplane that uh, Consolidated Volte made, designed. And we made over 18,000 of them during World War II. This was the most... I read that. You read that, yeah. Yeah. Somebody mentioned it last night on television on the History Channel. Yeah, that's more B-24s than any other aircraft. It doesn't seem possible with the F-80s, the F-86s, and everything else that was made. And of course the B-17s, everybody thinks of B-17s when you talk about bombers. Yeah, for some reason that, that one gets most of the publicity, it but... Uh, they still do. I wonder why. I don't know. I think, uh, do you remember when Harry Truman was in office during the Korean conflict? And uh, somebody said something about the Marines were having a convention in Cleveland or someplace. And they said that they had said something about the war in, in Korea. And Harry Truman said, the Marines have the best public relations outfit in the whole damn government. Well, they announced it at the convention that he had made that, and they all booed and they yelled. So Harry Truman, to his credit, went to the convention and apologized. He said he didn't mean to say that there was any detriment <laughs> to their valor, or to their vigor, or to their bravery. But he just thought that they were doing a good job publicly, relation-wise. Yeah. <laughs> well, somebody's done a very good job with the B-17 public relation-wise, too. Well, tell us, uh, if, if you wish, about your combat experiences, number of, number of sorties, and well, anything we, that happened. When, I, when we got there, well, first we left, left Salt Lake City and went to uh, Westover. At Westover, we flew submarine duty, which was very boring. Uh, and then from there, we went to... Uh, field in New York, Long Island, and we were in New York for about a month or so. And then finally we got orders, and they sent us over the, what was known as the Northern Route. Now, Lindbergh had done some work for the guy who was uh, president of uh, Pan American, and uh, his name was Juan Tripp, oddly enough, and Tripp hired uh, Lindbergh to find routes because he was building a transatlantic air aircraft. He was building an airplane, incidentally, it was called a clipper mm -hmm. that was amphibious. It had wheels and a little bow underneath it to make it float. And he wanted a northern route and a southern route. Well, Lindbergh pioneered these things. And this was the northern route. He says this was the shortest route, but you can't do it in wintertime. The weather's too bad. And we went from New York to uh, Newfoundland, Ganderfield, Newfoundland, to Iceland to Ireland, and that was the way we flew to England. When we got to England, we thought that uh, we were going to keep that airplane because it was brand new. It was a J, one of the first J's that came off the line. It was a great little airplane. Clean, it was all shiny. They took it away from us and, boy, put us in on trains and sent us down to, uh, to London, and then from London we went over to East Anglia where most of the activities, all of the activities, I think, of 8th Air Force were concentrated. It was fighter command, which was P-47s and P-51s and P-38s, bomber command. They had heavy bombardment and medium bombardment. The medium bombardment was B-25s and B-26s. And the heavies were uh, B-24s and B-17s. We had three divisions. And then we had another a composite division there which was composed of aircraft that was used for uh, uh, carrying things and also for surveillance, which we had a special, special cameras and special equipment. But in th there we, uh, we had training about a week of flying around in what we call orientation in, in England, and we attended several meetings 
by a training officer <clears throat> where he explained coastal defenses of the Germans because they were occupying France then and all the low countries. And we uh, learned where the ba various bases were, including an emergency field called Ford, which was right on the coast by Dover. And, uh, and then we came up to uh, D-Day, and before that we had been making bets about when D-Day would occur. I think I had May 31st. We each put a dollar in a pot. And I read just recently in a book by uh, a man named Miller, an English, Gilbert Miller, an English historian, that uh, actually May 31st was the first date that Churchill and Roosevelt had agreed was upon. It? That was submitted by Eisenhower, yeah. And the weather intervened. But the weather there, yeah. screwed them up, and so they didn't do it until the 6th of June. But anyway, on the 5th of June, we were in, uh, I think we were in the, in the barracks. There were Quonset huts, the barracks. And we were in the hut, and they have what they call a tannoy system, public announcement system. It said, all combat crews report to the briefing room at 10.30 at night. We had a, we guessed that's what it was. And when we went outside, we were sure because there were military police all around. You couldn't go any place on the base but to the briefing room. And we went in there, and they locked the doors on all of us again. And then our group commander came into the room. He said, at ease, he said, today is June 5th, and tomorrow morning at 5.30, the first troops are going to be landing in France. And they opened a map in here. They've got everything all mapped out. This is where the, they were going to land. This is Normandy Beach. This is uh, the old Dieppe, which they don't want to talk about. And this is the uh, Cotet Peninsula, and this is Brest Peninsula. But we're going in here. Now the troops are going in, some of them early this morning. He said they're on their way now. They're already embarked from Southampton, and uh, we have to bomb. We're going to do carpet bombing at about 10,000 feet, and we're going to uh, then proceed up toward Brest or down south, and then around this way. And he said, you can't get out of that channel don't, under any circumstance. And they put a white stripe on every airplane on the wing because we were afraid that Germans might have some aircraft that were crashed in, in the, uh, in, on the continent and they would take them and use them on this day. And this white line would distinguish our aircraft from the others. And uh, we took off that night just before midnight. And we were supposed to form at night. And it's very difficult to fly formation at night with no air. You're not supposed to have lights on the airplane. Uh, but they told us, if you didn't get with your group, just go with any group, any group you saw forming up there. Because we all had to be over there between, between a certain hour, between 3 and 5. At 5.30, they expected the Rangers to go in on the coast. And then at 6.30, the landing craft were going to be dropping off the, what was called the First Army Group. And uh, we followed the instructions. And my group, the 446th, was actually the first group in the 8th Air Force. We led the 8th Air Force that day. I was in the 6th airplane, I think, or 7th, to fly over the coast on D-Day. Oh, yeah. yeah, there were three in front of me, and three on one side, and I was three in the back. Uh, what an experience. God. And uh, you couldn't see the water. There were so many ships on it. Uh, I just read in this book by Gilbert Miller that there were six to eight thousand ships on, in the channel at that, just in this particular spot, yeah. and I thought there were five thousand. I would figure in my head, but anyway, six to eight thousand. You can imagine, and they had barrage balloons, because just in May of 1944, Hitler had uh, released the V2. Now, three months before that, he had released the V1 rockets. They were being built at Pinamundi in the northern part of Germany. 
And Werner von Braun was a young man, a scientist working there, and, and we captured him and brought him down to Redstone, Alabama, to develop the first mm -hmm. rockets for the United States. But uh, they had barrage balloons to protect them against the V-2 rockets. And we uh, stayed in that line because we were told that if you got out of it, the channel, the Navy would shoot shoot you. There were no, you could not fly over the ships. And when we were there, these battleships were there. You know how big a battleship is. Yeah. And these damn things were lined up and they were lobbing 16-inch guns on the coast. Uh, we had to get out. We had to go back to Cotentin or Brest or wherever it was and circle back to Southampton and back up to Norwich, East Anglia, to our bases. It was a long trip, but we had to do it that way. And then uh, we got back, I think it was uh, probably 8 or 8.30, and we had debriefings. The intelligence officer would ask you, how many, what did you see here, what did you see there? And they, we never saw, an, never saw an enemy airplane that day. And at 10.30, I got called again for another flight. We were going back again to drop again on someplace. Uh, where the uh, army ground pounders had asked for some help, some places. And uh, we were still hitting bridges in those days, too. You know, we had done that in, for two or three weeks before D Day, so that they wouldn't be able to send reinforcements because there was a, a big panzer army that Rommel had off to one side, which was a reserve. And I think it was three or four divisions of panzer units. And we didn't, the Army didn't want them to be brought down. So we were knocking out bridges. Well, they found a couple of bridges that hadn't been knocked out and they ordered them hit. It was a cloudy day. We were supposed to go in about 10,000 feet, 8,000 to 10,000 feet. We had to fly higher than that. The clouds were somewhat broken, so we were able to uh, see the land and we dropped where we were supposed to. However, on June, I think it was the 15th, a four-star general named Leslie McNair was in the forward. The generals never went forward. They always stayed back because they didn't want to be captured and reveal information. And McNair was with a Canadian group and with a, an army group. Bradley was scheduled to be there, but Bradley didn't go because Eisenhower had a meeting and Bradley was supposed to go to the meeting with Eisenhower. But I wasn't on this mission. At the time, I was on this mission, but I wasn't at the time the bombs were dropped short. They had markers, you know, the Haviland airplanes, the mosquitoes mm -hmm. made out of plywood. They dropped markers down. And when we saw markers, we were supposed to bomb beyond that. Well, they dropped markers and we dropped beyond that. And I think that was the day that Leslie McNair got killed. We call it now collateral loss, collateral firing. But it was terrible. We lost him and 1,500 Canadians and about 300 Americans, I think, that day. Air crewmen? No, they were ground. Oh, the ground. Ground people. Yeah. Oh, my God. Talib. But it was our fault. Got to go again. <laughs> I've got a phone call to make. <laughs> it's all right. Don't you worry about that. We got all day to do this. You say that's a J, huh? Well, that's what they say up there. They do say that, yeah. I think they had, they had one or two different turrets, and they had a little bit elongated nose. Okay, Colonel, that. That's got to be the most memorable experience uh, flying D-Day. It was. To remember things like that. It was. And you flew two consecutive... The third time, in the afternoon. <laughs> what? You didn't sleep for 36 hours? Oh, no. Well, we were listening to the radio. You know, they're giving reports. And uh, we had a, an American Red Cross van at the flight line. And these girls, American Red Cross, 
girls were serving grilled cheese and coffee. Hmm. I remember. I never went to the mess hall. And you flew three missions. Right down the flight line all the time, listening to the reports. And uh, you know, of all the groups, I don't remember how many there were of bombers. Uh, they were alternately going over. So we, at one time though, General Doolittle was in charge at that time. He said we put up 5,000 airplanes that day. Can you imagine? We'll never do anything like that again, you know. There'll never be any massive strike like this. Today, if we're going to go to a big war, a massive war against somebody, I think we can and we should use tactical atomic weapons. And uh, rather than risk 50,000 lives as we did here, or 50,000 on D-Day, uh, we drop a bomb, we don't have to put up 5,000 airplanes. And of course you've read recently where we're using drones for photographing yes. parts of the uh, cities and states and countries that we're occupying are working and warring in now. But those will be, those will be, I think, uh, important changes. And that's what Rumsfeld is trying to do now, is make some changes. Because our needs are so different now yeah. from what they were then. But 5,000 airplanes. Listen, I was on the ground that day, around the flight line, and I think I was standing on grass. You could feel the vibration from the engines of the airplanes that were flying. There were so many up in the air hmm. that I think the whole island was shaking. I've always wondered, and I'll ask you the question, you mentioned the 16-inch <coughs> uh, shells nice. that the Navy was lobbing over there. Did, did they do any good? Were they destroying any of those bunkers that Germans had? Well, there was one story in one book that I read. Oh, I think they did a lot of, sure. They did a lot of destruction. They would have to. But, you know, they had, a, they had great... The Germans were anticipating oh, yeah. something occurring there. That's why Rommel and von Rundstedt and Yodel, all field marshals were down there. But uh, they had armament built in underground with great big concrete ceilings and walls around them. And they had guns in there. Now, they were not big guns, uh, but they did have positions where they had anti-aircraft guns, and of course their big 88s and 108s were big anti-aircraft guns. Uh, but they had howitzers in these armament uh, shacks. And then they also had put down mines along the beaches. In the water they had mines, and they put barbed wire and, uh, and uh, had put broken concrete from buildings that were torn down or whatever. Into the uh, into the ocean, into the channel, and that was uh, all defensive work. They were very active, uh, and it was very important that uh, that they didn't know exactly where we were going to land. Yes. So there was a lot of deception deception programs that were going on at that time, and we really wanted them to think that we were going to go to Pas de Calais. Yeah. And they kept a lot of troops up there because of that. And then there was another uh, deception, trying to convince them we were going into Norway and come down through northern Germany, northern France. And then also we had indicated that we might come through the Low Countries, through Belgium, uh, just as Hitler did when he invaded France. You know, mm -hmm. France had the Maginot Line, and it didn't stop because they went around the uh, upper end of it. Yeah. <laughs> So you threw th three missions that day. How many missions altogether? My, I threw 31, but that didn't count. The last mission, which was a special one, I flew just because my crew had aborted on that last mission. They were flying with another pilot. And also, uh, 
On August 15th, Paris was liberated, and uh, we stood down for three or four days while we flew flour. So we put, they put B plywood, one inch plywood, in the, in the bomb bays of the B-24s, and they sent us down to Southampton where all the stores were. And I don't think anybody will ever see anything like that at Southampton again. You know, we, we accumulated a million and a half men, buildings, supplies, jeeps, tanks, landing craft in this area at Southampton. It was an incredible operation. Logistically, it was a tremendous thing. But we picked up flour, and I think they were in uh, Kilo. Uh, well, it's, I think, 60 pounds, probably. Uh, and we, they put them on our Bombay on the plywood, and we flew from Southampton to Paris. We landed at Orly. Uh, the Charles de Gaulle Airport wasn't built then, of course. And we landed at Orly on PSP, permanent steel planking. And there were still snipers, German snipers around the area. And, uh, we took, they unloaded, they had French laborers that unloaded the aircraft. And one guy gave me a picture of himself and his family. Of course, I didn't know who he was. And I threw it away the other day. We're getting to the point where we don't want to accumulate anything anymore. And uh, I often think, what a life this guy led. He was in occupied France. And it was occupied for four years. Yes. The French put up with a lot. Now, the Germans didn't occupy, occupy southern France. That was headed by the Vichy government. Mm -hmm. Patin. They were not occupied. Marshal Patin. Patin, yeah. So it was an interesting trip. Three missions, three, three days we dropped flour off. <clears throat> and I think the American troops were <clears throat> ordered to make a show because I have a friend who was a uh, 82nd Airborne junior officer, and he said uh, after they jumped the sixth or seventh time, one day somebody called them all up and said, we're going to Paris. We're not going to jump, though. We're going to go by truck, he said, because we're going to have to have a parade. Eisenhower wants a big parade. Well, I think he got an instructions from Washington to stage a big parade. So we got a lot of troops there, and uh, the last day we were there, they had this big parade. Uh, and we could see it from the air. It, was, it happened to be a nice day. <laughs> they walked down the Champs Elysees, I think 16 wide. Great parade. But from there, then you probably started your long range bombing? We, uh, we did, yes. We were after uh, petroleum, which became the next goal for us. Uh, railroads always were, but the fighters liked the. The, uh, the railroads, you've seen pictures of P-47s or P-51s swooping down on a train and firing. Yeah, P-47s particularly. P-47s particularly, yeah, they did that. <laughs> Those guys loved it. Yeah. And it reminds me of this speech that was just made by a general, Marine General Metis, where he's told a group of friendly people that uh, he enjoyed killing people because that's what war is. He enjoys... I read that. Yeah. It was an unfortunate remark, in fact, that it was quoted out of text. Yeah, I read but that. Nevertheless, what he said was illustrated in my time by the fighter pilots that would go down and they would go choo 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 choo. You know, we, we got another choo choo. And then we, if we ever shot down a German fighter, we put an iron cross on the airplane. Mm -hmm. And then for all the tonnage we dropped, why we kept these tonnage marks on the airplane for the bombs, and we you know, knew the bomb load. We had what was called nose art, which every plane had. Usually the pilot would choose a girlfriend or uh, his wife and uh, put it on the airplane. And I remember once, because Colonel Broger, our group commander, still alive, uh, and Father Murphy, who lived down here in Sun City, died last year, was our chaplain. One day, Father Murphy was raising hell about the nose art, and he said, we don't need to show naked women or 
body parts on a nose of an airplane going into combat. Said, These men are going to their death. They ought to be over with the grace of God. <laughs> and Colonel Brover said, that's youthful exuberance, Father. He said, I don't intend to put a stop to it. We'll make whatever we're... I'm going to let them put whatever they want on the nose of aircraft. So the nose on it was not subdued by a chaplain's complaints about it. No, I had two airplanes that I flew. One was called the Spirit of 77. 77 was a crew number. Somebody wrote into one of the publications recently and I answered it. Uh, you want to know why 77? Because we've always heard of the Spirit of 76. Remember that picture? Yeah. The drummer and the guy carrying the flag in the Revolutionary War? That's called the Spirit of 76. Well, 77 was a crew number. That's why it was used. And the other one was, uh, I can't remember the name of the other one. Uh, we flew, golly, I can't remember the name. It was, <laughs> it was uh, another one that uh, came back and... But and you didn't lose an airplane. I, no, I never lost one. I, uh, Almost, but not I quite. I came back with one engine, was yeah. close to it, yeah. And as a matter of fact, uh, that day, we had been bombing some oil refineries up in the north, outside of Hamburg, in a place called Politz, which was actually in the Polish corridor. Uh, the Germans, during the war, had uh, started to make alcohol out of potatoes, and uh, they were running their tanks on potato alcohol. Now we're trying to do the same thing with corn, corn. alcohol, yeah. But uh, the most of German industry still needed oil, and we were getting it from the north someplace. So this was a big, big refinery, and this was a long trip. It was called a deep penetration. And we got there, and uh, there were FW 190s, ME 109s lined up. ME 109s, a two-engine aircraft. The two engine aircraft stayed outside and they lobbed rockets into our formations, which tended to break them up. Mm -hmm. Although the group commander that day would say, don't change the formation, stay in tight formation. He would broke radio silence to tell us that because if we broke off, sure enough, the FW 190s came in and picked us off one by one. But when we were staying in formation, as I said, this other pilot, German pilot, said, when we stayed in formation, the firepower was deadly. It was awesome. And uh, so we were instructed to stay close in. Well, right over that target that day, I lost one engine. Well, I was able to keep up with the formation. And I said, I didn't have an, uh, an enviable spot. I was in fourth. It's called the slot position. You had a lead plane, left wing, right wing, and a slot. We called him Tail End Charlie. And most of our losses were Tail End Charlie that were shot down. And I was flying tail end Charlie in that flight that day. And um, I lost one engine over the target. I was still keeping up, but then we made a turn to come around, flew to the north, and then we we're going to circle around over the, uh, the Kiel Canal and come down to Germany toward Holland and Belgium, and uh, some flak came up and hit me and knocked out a second engine. Well, unfortunately, it was on the same side as the first one, so I had two feathered engines on one side, which is difficult for flying because you have all the power with the thrust on one side. So the co-pilot and I were trying to keep our legs on the rudders to keep it. But I couldn't stay in formation anymore, so I dropped out. Now, I was still over Germany. and. Uh, I decided I wanted to go to Sweden. I said to my navigator, give me a heading to Sweden. He says, no, we're halfway through our missions. We don't go to Sweden. He said, they'll send us back. I said, give me a heading. He never gave me a heading, so I continued to fly. And anyway, we got to France, and uh, we were alone. No airplanes around us. So I called. Colgate was the code name. Colgate, Colgate, this is Big Brother. I said, I'm alone, and I want to escort back to England if I can get it. Well, two airplanes came up. 
They were they were P-51s. And they flew this way and they were coming over to me and they wiggled their wings. Meant they were, okay. So they were flying with me. They were flying above me. And all of a sudden, out of a clear sky, one shot came up and hit one of the P-51s. Any aircraft shot? Hit his aircraft. Wow. And this was a memorable occasion, too, because it brought tears to my eyes. The guy says on the radio, you know, radio silence was supposed to be maintained, but his airplane is spiraling down. It's on fire. And he says, Joe, call Mabel tonight at 10358 and tell her I won't be able to make it. The guy never got out of the airplane. But he thought about calling a girl that he had a date with. And he gave his his other guy instructions to call him. But that shell came pretty close to you. It was very close, yeah. Well, anyway, the other guy comes up, shakes his wing, he's going. I said, okay. So he left. They really didn't have much endurance, you know, those people no. in those days. Later on, they put uh, wing tanks on, but these guys didn't come up with wing tanks. They only had about 45 or 50 minutes at the most. Is that all? Of endurance, yeah. yeah. So anyway, he goes back. I'll be a son of a gun if I don't lose another engine. Jeez. And I got one engine, and of course I can't maintain altitude now. And we're still in France, and uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm deciding where to go. And I asked the navigator, the heading for Ford, the big field, which is near the coast, which was designed for people in trouble. To land. They had 10,000 foot runways, 250 feet wide, which were, you know, today 10,000 feet is what you have at Palm Springs yeah. Airport. And I said, uh, we're going to go to Ford. So give me a heading to Ford, and he gives me a heading to Ford. Then we got over the channel, we were losing altitude fast, that's why I ordered everything thrown overboard. And the channel at that point, I think, is about 35 miles wide. And it would have taken us maybe. 10 or 15 minutes, but I don't think we could have made more 10, 15 minutes in the air. We were losing so much altitude. We were low already. And so we threw all the things over. And when we landed, uh, they had meat wagons and fire wagons out to meet us, but we didn't have any problem. I called the squadron from their operations room at 446, and they sent an airplane down to pick us up that day. And then a week later, my airplane was back in, on duty. We had great maintenance men in those days. Great maintenance men. Imagine they repaired three engines. They were shut up. He gave me a piece of uh, steel that was anti-aircraft. Just scrap steel, you know, they used inside those damn things. And he gave me that as a souvenir that he got out of the engine. But he replaced three engines on an airplane in one week. Did you have any hydraulic help on those controls, or did you? Hey, was it all manual? I lost my, I lost the hydraulic system. You see, How'd there were three engines. See how you kept it. Well, it was very what? difficult, very difficult. But that's, uh, number three engine is the one that had the hydraulic system on it, provided all the power for hydraulic. We had an APU, an auxiliary power unit, on board, and I don't think we started it up uh, because we had a line broken hydraulic line and all the fluid was gone. Uh, when we got down to one engine, it wasn't as bad because we took one engine on one side rather than two. Yeah. The two was made, made it tougher to keep straight. But nevertheless, we were able to keep it straight and, and land. God, we were lucky. And that was the second time I thought that God had selected me for some chosen field one day which he hasn't revealed yet, but it's going to come, I'm sure. <laughs> and he saved me from destruction that day. That was more we could than have been lost very easily. It was more than luck. It was good pilotage, too. No, we, we, we were lucky. We were lucky. We, I wish we'd gone to Sweden. Uh, they were sending them back, however. They sending them to England or to Germany? No, they sent them to England. Did they? Yeah. yeah. Oh. American troops went to England, but German pilots went to Germany. They were neutral. Yeah, I know they're supposed so to they, be. 
They were supposed to be, right? How far away were you from Sweden? Oh, 150 miles from Stockholm, yeah. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. The navigator we, didn't tell you to go up there. We were six hours from England, and yeah. one hour from... Well, he didn't want to go for some reason. And I still say, I, I talk to him about three or four times a year, and I say, Coakley, I, I was tempted to shoot you that day. I, well, you were in charge, weren't you? Oh, I was in charge. And I had a 45 on me, you know, and I, the co-pilot said, don't do it. No. I said, I'm going to shoot that son of a gun. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he refused to give me uh, a heading. I haven't forgiven him. This 60 years ago, and I still haven't forgiven I, him. I don't blame you. <laughs> if you were 150 miles from neutral country and they were yeah. sending him back to England. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, <laughs> that, that was your closest experience. Uh, but you had 31 missions altogether. Yeah. Which... Uh, is beyond the average by far. Well, they changed it from 25 to 30, and then I flew actually, not counting the flower missions, I flew with this extra one for my crew. Because on my last mission, what was supposed to be my last mission, I flew my airplane, and I had a crew and the co-pilot from a new crew had just arrived. This was cross training, we called it. And my co-pilot flew with my crew with a pilot from the crew that I, I was flying with. Cross training. Well, I made this mission and came back, but my co-pilot and my crew with this new pilot here aborted for some reason. I never did know why they aborted. They, they didn't make it. Uh, they didn't get beyond the channel for some reason. So when I landed after the mission, here are all these guys, my co-pilot, my navigator, and my eight, six enlisted men standing there. And I thought, well, this is wonderful. They're out here to greet me. <laughs> <laughs> they really think a lot of me. <laughs> and so they said, uh, they used they used to call me something like chief or something. It was terrible. But he said, uh, we want to talk to you. And I said, what's wrong? He said, we didn't complete our missions today. <laughs> oh, so you took them back and up. They were, oh, they were downtrodden. They were so depressed. They said, we can fly tomorrow. We've already spoken to the squadron commander. Uh, I see. And they'll let us fly tomorrow, but we want you to fly us. I said, I'm through. I'm finished. No more for me. I'm going up now. Final briefing. And they're going to give me a shot of whiskey. They give everybody a shot of whiskey at the last mission. And so they said, we'll go with you. See, we're my co pilot. We'll go. So we know they each got a shot because they thought it was their last mission. The people on the ground thought that everybody gave me theirs. Theirs. <laughs> so you flew them the next day. And I agreed to fly the next day while I was drunk. It was a terrible thing they did to me. But I went to the mess hall. And there was some guy there that uh, had just come over, and I was uh, exuberant, drunk is what I was. <laughs> and we had ice cream. Don't very often get ice cream. Had ice cream that day. And my co-pilot and navigator told me later that I kept talking to this guy and I kept t filling my spoon with ice cream, taking part of it off, and going like this, talking, <laughs> gesticulating with my hand like a uniform covered with ice cream. He said he was really teed off. I said, well, <laughs> I'm sorry for him. <laughs> he should have been careful talking to me when I'm drunk. Well, for doing that, your crew was pretty loyal to you. Oh, then. yeah, very, very loyal. Yeah, they were good. We had a, a very good loyal bunch. Actually, uh, I lost one crewman one day with a piece of flak. And uh, one day in June, a guy ahead of me taking off uh, was up about 500 feet and a bomb fell through, not fastened securely in the bomb bay. It fell through the bomb bay doors. It exploded and flipped his airplane over like this. Two men got off the airplane. One was a waste gunner. And another was a photographer that came from Stars and Stripes that was flying with us, was flying with Zeller that day. 
and uh, the uh, the crewman who survived walked away from the thing. It was amazing, and he joined my crew because I was missing one guy. So he finished the last 15 or 16 missions with me. A skinny kid from Kentucky, Tennessee, or someplace like that. He spoke with a real southern accent. Uh, but he was a good man, good loyal man. How, how many times have you had a reunion with your crew? None. They're all dead but one. Really? Yeah. I met my co-pilot a number of times. He died of a heart attack about five or six years ago. But when I was living in Denver, why, he visited me because he had a factory in, uh, in California, Northern California, where he uh, made pills and he sold them osteopaths, uh, chiropractors, and they could dispense these because they were not controlled pills, like vitamins. And, oh, I see. Uh, I think they were placebos. Anyway, C. Roy would sell them. He called them C. Roy was the line. And uh, he'd come in to sell these pills to some chiropractors. And uh, I'd have lunch with him. So we saw him. Met his wife and his children. C. Roy I've known. C. I mean, Coakley by Navigator. His oldest son became an instructor at the Air Force Academy. And... Uh, Coakley came out to visit him once and spent a day with us because we were only 45 minutes from the academy. And uh, the rest of them, I sent Christmas cards to, oh, Siegler, the older guy. He was 28 years old. He was the oldest man on our crew. We called him Pappy because he was so old. He was in Florida. And when I got married, he sent us a, a, a wedding present. And I communicated with him for a few years. And then we just lost contact. You know, we all get busy. Yeah. Well, a after your uh, missions were completed, you stayed in the Air Corps then, didn't you? Well, I stayed in England as squadron training officer for the uh, 705th Squadron. And I did the orientation flights, and I flew the forming ship, and I held classes for the new pilots and a few other things like that. Squadron training officer. Then, in November... 44, uh, the squadron commander asked me if I wanted to go home, and I said, okay. So we got orders to go home. We went home on the SS America. And Copley and I shared two hammocks in an engine room. It was hot, smelly, and noisy as can be. Those engines. Sure. They were in hammocks. It was nine days going back to America. And uh, I think we had some German prisoners on the ship. We came back, and I went to uh, a place outside at Murfreesboro, outside of Nashville, to a uh, airfield called Stewart. Now there's a, there's a base up at at the Army Training Academy, Military Academy. Well, Stuart, this was Stuart, or vice versa. Anyway, I was an instructor in four-engine aircraft there, and that was a nice assignment. We flew around the country, and on the day that uh, Roosevelt died, April 1945, I was at this base. I was flying that day, and I had the radio compass on because the radio compass was good for going back. Nashville had a strong... I don't know, 20, 30, 40,000 watt station. And you could pick it up quite a few miles out. And uh, somebody interrupted the program to say that Franklin D. Roosevelt was dead, had died of a heart attack in Warm Springs, Georgia. Now I'm flying in the left seat, I'm the instructor pilot, and here's the student pilot. <clears throat> We're both college graduates. We're cream of the crop. We went to pilot school. We're smart guys. This guy says to me, who's the president now? And I say, Henry Wallace. <laughs> he was Secretary of Agriculture. He was. Well, he was being, wasn't he, wasn't he vice president one time? 
Or did he was. He was he, one he, time. The, about the fourth term that FDR had. FDR Wallace. quit him on the th after the third term. Yeah, and then. And then Truman came Spearman in. Your man Harry Truman. Who, who, I hadn't heard anything about <laughs> Truman, so here I am. I thought a knowledgeable young man, and this guy says, "Oh yeah, that's right." <laughs> and we lost. <laughs> And so we landed and uh, we had a day of mourning at the base, lowered the flags to half mass for 30 days. And uh, then I went to Buckley Air Force Base because there was something on the bulletin board one day about administration. Uh, they needed somebody in administration. And somebody had told me that if you want to stay in the Air Force, you have to have more than just pilot experience, you have to be an administrator. So I said to the guy in personnel, I'd like to go up there. And the next morning he said, you got the assignment. He said, you'll be on your way. I'll get cut the orders this afternoon. You'll be on your way tomorrow. Anyway, I was assigned to Buckley as unit personnel officer. And uh, I had never been to Colorado. I say, how did I travel? I think I traveled by train. Yeah, I did. And uh, I think I went up to Chicago. And then I got uh, a famous train that used to go all the way to California. Uh, and I arrived in Denver at 9 or 9.30 in the morning. And they had buses that went out to Buckley. Buckley was then considered uh, 25 miles east of Denver. Today it's all one jumbled metropolitan area. And, uh, I reported for duty there, a unit personnel officer, and I flew almost every week. I had a lot of, I had carte blanche at, at Buckley. I flew lots of aircraft, and I, I'd just go down to the flight line and say, I'd like to fly today, I'd like to, you know, I want to go to St. Louis, or I want to go to Laramie, I have a friend up at Casper, I want to go Mountain Home, I wanted to go someplace else. And nobody ever checked on anything, I just checked out airplanes. It was a good experience. But the greatest experience is I met my wife there. She was working at personnel. She had just graduated from high school, was going to go to uh, CU. And was working for the, in the summer at Buckley. And uh, we had three dates. And in January of 46, we got married. Hmm. And I got out of the military in January of 46. And uh, I went back. To Rutgers, I did one semester at Rutgers, and, and then I went back to uh, Denver because she missed Denver and wanted to go back. And so we went back to uh, Denver, and I went to the University of Denver. I got a job at the University of Denver as assistant director of adult education. I did some graduate work in economics, and then I taught a class or two in economics. I went to some program called the Teaching Institute of Economics funded by the Sloan Foundation and I got my degree at DU in economics. But then, in then 19... Then you could huh? call back in. 51, I got orders, yeah. Now I hadn't been any reserve unit, I hadn't been any place, nothing. And I got a letter in the mail one day and it said report to Lowry Air Force Base. And so I did. And I was still classified a combat pilot. And uh, I got an assignment, however, because of my education in the controller shop. And I became management analysis officer and then budget and fiscal officer. And, and I liked Larry. Of course, I was in Denver. I liked that portion of it. And then we had our second child in Denver. And... Uh, then they sent me overseas. I had orders to go to uh, Germany, and alone, not with the family. So I went to Germany, and uh, went over back to Westover, where I'd been training back in 1944, and went over by air, over the same route that we had taken several years earlier, when we went to England, Newfoundland. Goose Bay, Gander, Iceland, Reykjavik, and then Northern Ireland, and then England. Anyway, 
I was assigned to uh, the Wiesbaden military post. Germany was still occupied. It was divided into military posts. And Wiesbaden was the only military post which was run by the Air Force. Wiesbaden Mill Post, a 7100th Headquarters Support Group. And we had uh, the uh, United States Air Forces Europe there and the uh, 9th Air Force Tactical Air Command. Uh, we were still in a mode to protect Europe from the Colossus known as the USSR, the Soviet Republic, Soviet Union. And uh, to my amazement, we had this base, Camp Lindsay it was called, in Wiesbaden, on the east side of the Rhine with the United States Air Force's headquarters. And what we were doing on the east side of the Rhine River I don't know either. with a big headquarters, we shouldn't have done that, but anyway, that's the way it was. Had you safe, the tactical command, and uh, so I spent three years, flew all kinds of airplanes, three years during the Korean conflict in Germany. And that was a great experience. I don't regret anything in my military life. I really think I was very lucky and I enjoyed most of what I did. I enjoyed flying, I enjoyed the tours, I enjoyed the bases, and I enjoyed meeting some good people, the ones I call good Americans, good citizens. And uh, when we were in Germany, uh, we had a lot of three-day passes. We could go to Paris in one day, we could go to Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Belgium, the coast, the Gold Coast, Spain, I went to Spain. Then I flew, I was flying C-46s, C-47s, what we call the Goonie Birds, which is a DC-3, mm -hmm. because we had a couple of them at the base. And uh, I would be ordered to fly someplace to pick somebody up, or maybe London, pick somebody up and bring them back to Germany to meet with the commander of USAFE. Uh, I flew uh, some, we were just getting into, uh, I think we're just just getting into F-80s. <clears throat> so I flew some F-80s. I had a great time flying in, in Germany. And uh, a good friend of mine, who uh, was with Special Air Missions, Sam Squadron. Sam is operated out of uh, Maryland, and they run the Air Force One program. Mm -hmm. But they also had a base over in Europe. And uh, they would do courier runs occasionally, but they did a lot of missions, what we call transporting VIPs, like uh, uh, well, the French generals were using the SAM squadron as much as anybody. Uh, and one day, Bill Kuhn and I took, I was in the co-pilot cool position, he was in the pilot position, he was the SAM squadron pilot. We were going to Berlin. Now, Berlin was an occupied city by the four powers, and we had a channel that we flew, and it was very narrow, but you couldn't get out of that channel because the Russians occupied both sides. Yeah, of them. I know. And uh, that day happened to be June of 1952, I think. Yeah, it was. 52. There was a riot in Berlin. And students, the young people, had filled bottles with gasoline and put wicks in them. And that was the, my first acquaintance with the Molotov cocktail. And they were throwing them at the Russian tanks. And the Russians really split. They were really subdued by these students. Really? Uh, however, they did move in a couple of divisions, you know, and they put it down very quickly. But uh, when we flew in, where there were tanks on the road burning, and there were trucks burning, and there were students running around, and there were fires all over, we landed and uh, completed our mission. We delivered a package, picked up somebody, dropped somebody off, and uh, we landed at Tempelhof, which was the big Berlin air base. We got back, and of course, the first 
guy that met us was an intelligence officer and wanted to know what we saw. Yeah. How many trucks did we see? And I wasn't counting trucks, but uh, how many trucks did we see? How many troops did we see moving? How many Russian troops were there in Berlin? And how many? Anyway, we did a great debriefing. It took about two hours to debrief because that was a big day in Germany. When did you finally leave the Air Corps then? Uh, any, let me think, 41 and, and uh, was 60 something. 60, uh, so I went in 42, so I left at 63 or 64. Okay, then what followed? What kind of a civilian career did you have? I've been very lucky again. Uh, <laughs> You're very modest. No, no, I'm very lucky. My, uh, I had a, uh, a friend in Denver who was working for a, uh, an investment company, but they had a guy on their staff that bought and sold businesses, and he had uh, sold the Hall Cadillac to Rick and Bohr, and he sold the City Elite Laundry to Hanson, and he sold some other business. And he said to me one day, he said, you know, he said, I think you're, you could be a small businessman. He said, you've got the instincts of a businessman, and I think you've got the personality to do this. Come on down, and we'll meet, meet this guy that owns Colorado Paint Company. So we went down, we met this guy, he was 80 some odd years old. He was in a brace because he'd been fishing and fell down and broke his back. <clears throat> and he had to get out of business. And so Walt Davis wrote a letter for me. And he offered five, he said, how much money do you have? I said, about $5,000. I've got 100 shares of Burroughs stock and I paid 1400 for this, now worth about 4800 I got about $5,000. I said, you know, I never met him. Two hundred and fifty dollars a month is what I got as a captain in during the Korean conflict. And uh, I said, I got two kids. He said, well, let's offer him five thousand dollars for this business plus uh, whatever it takes for the rest of it. He said, we'll finance out of the business. So we made an offer. I think it was about forty-two thousand total. Five thousand in cash. And Mr. Lemon was so pained with his broken back, he accepted it. Hmm. So I bought Colorado Paint Company for $5,000 down. It was a paint manufacturing plant. And I moved it to a new location, a new building, bought some new equipment and, and built it up. When I bought it, it was only doing well, 180000 a year. And I kept increasing by 20 or 25 percent every year until I turned it over to my son 12 years ago. And we were doing eight or nine million dollars a year. Well, that's and remarkable. Doing, I thought it was good. Yeah. And I had I built a couple of buildings, built three buildings. Then after that, after I sold it to my son, in ninety-three, I was seventy years old. And I heard the city of Denver was looking for somebody to recycle paint. So I went down and talked to the head of recycling or the head of solid waste, it was called. And I started a recycling company. And I operated that for two years. And I was 73 when, or oh, the reason I did it is they gave $100,000 to start it. So I was well taken care of. And then I charged everybody for bringing in their old paint. And then we sold the old, we reworked it, made new paint, and I sold it. It was a good business. And I saw something on uh, Howie Hooser the other day where he's down in L.A. And he's at a paint recycling plant. And they were doing, uh, doing the same thing I was doing. Uh -huh. I couldn't find anybody to buy it, so I closed it up. And we moved out here permanently. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so how long how, uh, how, how long have you been in Palm Springs then? Ten years? Twelve years? No, eight years. Eight. Yeah. Actually, uh, we rented here, though. For about 12 years before that, mm -hmm. we rented at Monterey Country Club, and now I uh, we bought a house here in '97, uh, and uh, we still have a house in Denver, and we've always gone back to Denver in the summertime. It's difficult to get out of our blood because we have a house that we've lived in for 41 years, raised all our kids there, and uh, and incidentally, we had a son born in Germany. When I was over there in Germany, over in Wiesbaden, the Wiesbaden Hospital, yeah, 
And I still say, Kevin, speak some German to us. He can't do it. <laughs> but, uh, we uh, we uh, had another daughter in Denver when the other kids were all in their teens. This one came along a little later in life. But uh, we've decided we've got to sell this house now because when I go back to Denver, I just go breathe well. I didn't really believe that about <laughs> breathing, but it's, it's very true. And so it's bad. I'm going. So this last two weeks, we went to Seattle, and I bought a house up there. Did you? Yeah, right on the ocean, on the Sound. And my daughter lives up there, and she's married to a doctor. She's a physical therapist. They have an athletic club. So we've got a little nest to begin with. We've got some help if we need it from a doctor and my daughter. So I think it's a good move. Were you familiar with the Air Museum here uh, before you talked to Bob Butler? Oh, yeah. I was out here several times. I brought my grandsons here, too. I wanted them all to see. I knew there was a PT-19 out here, and I wanted to see that. And I wanted them to see. There was once a, a B-17 here. Do you still have it? A B still here. Yeah. We went through that, and I said that uh, I flew an airplane just slightly bigger than that, but about the same configuration, four engines. Uh, but I've been here three times, I think. And then I did... Yes, you brought something with you there. Well, Let's see I what gave, that is. I gave the museum a copy of this book. From Young Boys to Fighting Men. Let me zo hold that up, Ken. I want, I want to zoom in on it. Very good. I gave a copy of this book to the museum here. And it was written by my brother, and would you believe it, I've got a paragraph or two in here. <laughs> no, I've got three chapters. And my younger brother, who was in the Navy, has a chapter in here. He's dead now, but uh, he was on the, uh, the Bonham Richard and then another one that was bombed by uh, kamikazes in the Bay of Leyte Bay over in the Philippines. Mm. And my other brother is dead, who was in the Army. So he didn't get a place in this book. But this is about guys, several of whom I know. Uh, one guy happens to be my brother Larry's brother-in-law, and he's, he died a few months ago, too. And another man who was captured on a corregidor and was on the death march and then went to a mine in Japan. To work as he a survived all that? He survived all of that. Isn't that amazing? And he just died a few months ago. The guy was really, and his story is terrific. Every one of these stories is marvelous. And I thought you might like to have it. If you read it, read my chapters, and then give it to somebody else. I, I will do that, Colonel. Um, I have a friend over there where I live, and we exchange these military books back yeah. and forth. We yeah. we both watch the History Channel, and I we do too. trade these yeah. books back and forth. Yeah. yeah, I've got a guy who was a retired colonel over in Monterey. He was an engineer in Korea and in Vietnam, and he's always telling me about books. Was well, there anything else? Uh, we are just about the end of the tape here. Anything else you'd like to conclude with? Well, I'd like to say that uh, our military today is as good as it's ever been. They're good people. There may be some people that uh, abuse someone here or there, but you know, war is they kill you or you kill them. It's a struggle. And that's how we gauge success in war. If we kill more of them or make them want to quit because they're afraid of being killed, than we want. So we mustn't condemn them for being killers. That's the way we train them. We want them to be have integrity and some honesty in what they're doing. But we've got a very, very good military, good officers, good leadership, good civilian leadership now, and I think they deserve all the support that we can give them. Well, thank you, and a ta this tape will end up after we get it edited and a few more refinements put on it, end up in the uh, Library of Congress. Really? I yes. didn't know it was going to the Library of Congress. Oh, yeah. Really? Good. Yes, it will. Good. Ken, thank you very much for coming in. This has been well, a thanks for inviting most... me. I think it's wonderful that I had the opportunity to talk. I'd like to talk.
Well, you, you do a good job. No, I don't, but actually, <laughs> for years, you know, we never talked about it. I didn't find anybody that wanted to hear about World War II. So I'm glad there are some people interested now. Thank you. Well, the reason I'm so interested in it, I...